Madam Chair, I would like to also bring a substitute bill. Would you prefer that I hold that until after, or may I bring it forward at this time? Hold it. Let's hold it until after the break. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Uh, I now bring House Bill 327 for its first hearing. Um, and pursuant to Rule 37, I am excusing Representative Grendel from, here, from appearing for her testimony. With us today is Representative Fowler Arthur to present sponsor testimony and Representative Holmes to um, provide Rep. Grendel's sponsor testimony. Welcome. Thank you, Vice Chairman uh, and Ranking Member Kelly and the members of the House House State and Local Government Committee. And thank you for this opportunity to speak on House Bill 327, legislation that promotes education and not indoctrination. Uh, um, let's start with the bottom line. Racism is always wrong. Our legislation seeks to correct a growing concerning educational curriculum that has found its way into our state schools and workplace training. This curriculum does not challenge students to think critically or inspire them to embrace their individualism in our society. Rather, it attempts to imbue them with the notion that they're either oppressed or the oppressor. That, based off the color of your skin, nationality, or ethnicity, you have a predisposition to behave or think a certain way. As a Reverend Martin Luther King, a man who championed equality for all humans, stated darkness cannot drive out darkness and hate cannot drive out hate. Prohibited divisive concepts are clearly defined with the bill as, within the bill as training or requiring some to believe that they're better or worse than another person based solely upon the external characteristics of nationality, race, color, ethnicity, religion, or sex, similarly described in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Teaching our children that they're either victims or victimizers does not inspire change or love, but it's rather it's divisive and creates a conundrum in their minds. America, since its inception, has stood on the grounds of individual excellence. In our bill, we will promote respect for all. Each person alone holds keys to his or her destiny and must create a personal legacy in this sometimes unforgiving world, compelling our children to believe that they are prone to succeed based on qualities they cannot change, such as their skin color or ethnicity, removes all sense of individual responsibility. Why should a child try and aspire to be their best self when they're told that they will definitively act in a particular way? This educational curriculum breeds complacency and self-hate and threatens core American values that are our national champions. The purpose of this bill is to provide equal and non-discriminatory education opportunities to students while preventing further division among Americans. House Bill 327 specifically encourages the objective instruction and impartial discussion about divisive concepts while prohibiting the promotion, indoctrination, or forced acceptance of the concepts contained in there. We do not advocacy, as stated before. We do not believe in assigning fault, blame, or bias to individuals because of their race, color, nationality, or sex. Claiming that consciously or unconsciously, and by virtue of his or her race, color, nationality, or sex, members of any race are inherently racist or are inherently inclined to oppress others, or that members of a sex are inherently sexist or inclined to oppress others. We do not believe in engaging in any conduct or educational activity that promotes or teaches the concept that one race or sex is inherently superior or inferior to another race or sex. Requiring teachings or training in these topics as a prerequisite for or to retain employment or compelling educational beliefs in these topics. This bill does not prevent schools or government entities from teaching about racism, slavery, and segregation. What it does do is prohibit schools from indoctrinating students by claiming one race is superior to another or that individuals should be treated differently on the basis of race. House Bill 327 encourages the objective instruction about and discussion of divisive concepts rather than allowing taxpayer dollars to be spent on concepts that indoctrinate and divide rather than unite students. Um, after hearing these tenets, it's, uh, we're encouraged to think about how harmful and detrimental it is to compel our impressionable children to believe such things. Is this the vision that champions of the civil rights movement and all those who worked on bridging our divides as humans through cooperation, love, and understanding would have hoped for? This bill is not a response, but rather an affirmation that no matter the color of the skin, of your skin, your ethnicity, your ancestral family calls home, your gender, you're an individual. Racism and sexism are simply unacceptable. 
We as individuals must ensure that our schools educate on the issues of injustice and intolerance, not those issues to create injustice and intolerance. Our bill does not prohibit the teaching of injustice throughout our country and the world, oppression, historical documents, or the discussion of controversial topics in the classroom. House Bill 327 will ensure that our students are, be taught, are being taught how to think, not what to think. The goal is to educate students to think critically, as mentioned before, and not be compelled to believe ideology that constrains them within the limits of an oppressed or oppressor relationship. This is a significant statewide issue, and we've heard from colleagues as well, and that is the reason why we have 35 co-sponsors on this bill. Thank you to all of them for their support. I urge your support of House Bill 327, the Dignity and Non-Discrimination in Education Act. Thank you for hearing the testimony. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair John, Ranking Member Kelly, and members of the House State and Local Government Committee. Um, I will be addressing my comments specifically to the substitute bill, which I'm going to be uh, asking the committee to adopt and keeping my comments brief to allow time for um, whatever questions you have. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to bring House Bill 327 before you this morning and thank Representative Holmes for standing in and representing uh, or presenting the testimony on Representative Grindel's behalf. I was honored to be invited to joint sponsor such timely and important legislation, which affirms the contributions of all Americans to our great nation and the refinement of the founding concepts of freedom, equality for all, just and equal treatment under the law, and the opportunity to follow your dreams. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. From the very conception of our country, the Declaration of Independence outlined the then controversial ideas of individual responsibility, individual accountability, and equality under the law, which has since become the bedrock of our civilization. While we have certainly grown in our understanding and practical application of these principles, the truth remains that we would not be the nation we are today without the belief affirmed in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that, quote, it shall not be lawful to discriminate against any individual because of an individual's race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, end quote. House Bill 327 further affirms and strengthens Ohio's non-discrimination policies and expectations for K-12 and higher education in classroom instruction, teacher and principal training, and state and local government employee training. We've received concerning reports that individuals are being held to an ideological purity test to maintain their employment or receive a good grade in a given class. That ideological test is often based upon external characteristics rather than the foundational principles of our nation or the intrinsic value of an individual's character. The promotion of concepts that hold our seven, eight, and nine-year-old children responsible for the crimes of the past generation goes against everything our nation stands for. It is, un it is an unconscionable perversion that any child should be held personally responsible for the sins of their father or a group of individuals in the past. This is not justice. We are a nation founded on individual responsibility, individual accountability, and individual accomplishment and failure. House Bill 327 protects children and employees right to learn American history in an objective and historically accurate manner without taxpayer dollars being used to promote an ideology of racism and group guilt. It protects state and local government employees from being subjected to an ideological purity test to receive or maintain employment. It strives to ensure that every Ohioan is treated equally under the law and that every individual enjoys the rights and privileges of a non-discriminatory, objective representation of education and historical facts. Um, Madam Chair, I'm happy to answer questions or to wait uh, at your pleasure. Thank you both for being here and providing sponsor testimony. As I stated, we are getting ready um, for a break, and I apologize. I had a previously scheduled appointment, as did uh, Representative Wiggum. So we will um, recess until 1.15. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh
uh, we'll get started and resume where we left off. And I want to uh, say thank you to uh, Vice Chair John for her for her work in taking over and uh, bringing us almost to the end of our our our, uh, our committee hearing here. Um, at this particular time, um, uh, I will. Uh, um, uh, acknowledge uh, Representative Fowler Arthur for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to substitute House Bill for. I move to substitute with Sub Bill 1448-4. Okay. Would the representative item. explain the bill or the substitute bill? Excuse me. Yes. Um, I would direct people to the comp doc that is available in our committee materials as well but I just would like to highlight a few points. Uh, this ex includes all of the protected classes in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It elaborates on the intent for um, permitting teaching about divisive concepts, but prohibits promoting a Marxist ideology. It includes the addition of political subdivisions in the prohibition of an ideological purity test to receive or maintain employment and it specifies the consequences for knowingly and recklessly promoting a divisive concept for employment or education. Okay. Uh, are there any objections to the amendment? Yes. Okay. Representative Kelly objected um, to the amendment, to the sub, excuse me, the sub bill. And uh, so uh, we will have the clerk call the roll. Chairman Wiggum. Yes. Vice Chair John. Yes. Ranking Member Kelly. Yes. Representative Callender, Representative Creech, yes. Representative Dean, yes. Representative Fowler Arthur, yes. Representative Golonsky, yes. Representative Ginter, Representative Brousseau, Representative Skindel, yes. Representative Sobecki, Representative Wilkin. <laughs> did you get everybody? I did not forget. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the sub bill becomes uh, becomes the bill. Um, okay. So we're going now. Committee questions. Okay. Well, uh, are there questions from the committee? And if uh, Representative Fowler Arthur and Representative Holmes would. Re uh, resume at the podium. That would be great. And do we have committee questions? All right. We'll start off with uh, Representative Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I wanted to um, start out my questions uh, about this idea of a divisive concept um, and to talk about what exactly does that mean, how you arrived at that definition. Because, um, I mean, divisive uh, seems pretty subjective uh, as a general rule. I know that you um, added some more specificity, so I wasn't sure if you were using um, something else as a model um, to uh, create the definition of that term. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Kelly. And um, divisive concepts is clearly laid out in the bill and in the substitute bill as well. I think it's uh, very similar, except that in the substitute bill language, it goes to include all of the protected classes within the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And um, I'm not sure what was used in defining all of the categories that were included because Representative Grindel was working on the language as well. But my understanding is that um, the goal was really to outline uh, some of the principles that are being uh, problematic in Marxist ideology and to make sure that we teach about those concepts, but that we are not promoting them. And so you'll see in the list on pages two and three that it is specific to things that pit people against one another based upon external characteristics such as race. Follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, so I guess my question is, is that something that the two of you developed on your own, or is it, a mo is it model language from somewhere else? Um, beg your pardon? Chairman Wiggum and Representative Kelly, I will say that this language was a part of the bill when I was asked to joint sponsor, so I'm not sure that I can completely give you an answer on the backstory of if Representative Grindel sourced other sources, but um, for my part, I was I was 
very happy to include the Civil Rights Act as part of our reference. Follow-up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and so maybe we can ask, um, I will try to follow up with Rep. Grendel um, offline about that. Um, one of the other questions I wanted to talk about is this idea of employers and ideological purity tests and sort of what that looks like in practicality. Can you give me some examples? Is this something um, widespread? This is not something that um, I've heard anything about, so I was interested um, to hear about that in your testimony. So I was just wondering if you could uh, give, provide some concrete examples of that. Thank you, uh, Chair Wiggum and Representative Kelly. I would like to, but I didn't want to um, inappropriate portray anyone's story. So I've asked some of the proponents that are coming in to share directly about their experiences. We have had um, several people reach out to us about specific instances within local government entities. We've had some examples of state government entities, higher education as well as local school board discussions. So that is why all of those entities are included in the bill. However, um, when it comes to specifically speaking about that, I'm gonna ask those who experienced it themselves to come and share with the committee so that I don't get any of the details incorrect. Okay. Representative Sobecki. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, representatives, for being here today. Uh, so I'm curious, I was gonna go through here and look again really quick, but is your bill, um, like the previous bill that we heard before we went on um, before we went on break was was um, pointed at K through um, 12. So is your bill pointed just at K through 12, or is it into the higher education as well? Thank you, Chair Wiggum and Representative Sobecki. Um, actually, House Bill 327 is a broader bill than House Bill 322. It includes K-12 education, higher education. Um, local government entities and state government entities. And going back to um, what I referenced with Representative Kelly, it, ex it includes all of those entities because they are all government entities and we've had concerns raised in each of them. So we wanted to encompass them all within the bill. Follow up. Thank you. I'm just curious, um, could these not be handled at the local level? I mean, we talk a lot about in this General Assembly, um, even from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, that talks about local control, and we, and we tend to pick and choose at times when we want to have local control. So I'm just wondering uh, why you feel the need to not have this at the local um, control. Thank you, Chair Wiggum, Representative Sobecki. It definitely would be my preference that we also have local resolutions and local boards or local government entities taking proactive steps in this area. The concern has become that the state has been sending conflicting messages for the past year at a minimum. And so there has already been a precedent where the state has gotten involved and feel that it's very important to clarify what the state's position on divisive concepts or discrimination is at the state level. Follow up. Thank you. Um, I'm just kind of curious also, have you reached out um, or heard from teachers where this is an issue from um, OEA or OFT, have you contacted those organizations, OSBA, o o o o um, BASA, et cetera? Yep. Thank you, Chair Wiggum and Representative Sebecki. Um, we have gotten some specific feedback from teachers within my district, and um, I hope that they will come and share their personal experiences with you directly as well. Um, one teacher shared feedback that she's seen this throughout all of their teacher preparation materials, that they're feeling pressured within their district to um, teach a particular ideological perspective, not just a well-rounded perspective, and that they are concerned that if they don't, it might impact their employment or their teacher rating. And so I'm hopeful that she'll come and share that experience with you directly so that you can better understand it in its full context. but. We have had conversations with people um, across the board and at an individual level, they have shared that this is a concern. Mr. Chair, I have additional questions. So could, no, could I, I come I, back I, to you? If you could, in the next round. We'll come right back. Thank you. Uh, Representative Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, sponsors, for your testimony. I just uh, want to kind of clarify the, uh, you know, the list of things that we are defining as a divisive concept because obviously when we start getting into 
you know, what, what folks can and can't say, the, the definitions have to be pretty precise. Um, and I kind of seized on the first one, one nationality, we're calling it a divisive concept to teach that one nationality is inherently superior to another nationality. And I guess I'm just thinking aloud here. I know you have some exceptions and, and maybe the argument would be that they, they, we might be able to fit this into one of those exceptions. But what if I'm a high school history teacher teaching on the Cold War and it's my, and I teach that the United States and Western democracy is inherently superior to the Soviet Union. Are we creating a trap for teachers that would say that that's a divisive concept to say that, you know, American democracy is inherently superior to communist China? Chairman, uh, let, me, let me clarify before I go viral. I understand, <laughs> I understand that the Cold War was between uh, the United States and uh, the Soviet Union, but extending that to today, for example, uh, would it be a divisive concept for a, Ameri for a history teacher to say that uh, the United States is inherently superior to communist China? Chair Wiggum, Representative Stewart, we're glad we won't have to remand you to history. In <laughs> but um, the intent of the bill is to permit, pro prohibit promoting a particular ideology. We want to enable freedom in the classroom to talk about and teach about those concepts. So that would allow the, the give and take on the pros and cons of any particular ideology. The real action word in this bill to me is promotes. And so the focus is on not promoting but on teaching. And there are several references, I think it starts on page seven, talking about the um, importance of teaching objectively, making sure that you're including historical facts and making sure that it is a, a comprehensive discussion in the classroom or outside of it. Follow up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Representative Skindell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, your remarks and being here today. Um, uh, Representative Arthur Fowler, um, you, you had the experience of serving on the state school board uh, for a period of time. And I'm kind of curious as to, through your experience there, if you saw anything done at the state school board that uh, uh, raise some concern to you that falls with, within the ambits of this bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Skindell and Chair Wiggum. Um, I would say yes. And as mentioned earlier, we were starting to see this coming into our teacher and principal evaluation system as a um, concern. And last summer, there was a resolution, number 20, July 20th, um, I'm sorry, in July, Resolution 20, that uh, really focused on promoting a particular uh, doctrine. And there was a lot of language being thrown around about inherent racial inequities. And there was a lot of concern that this was going to send mixed messages down to the local level. So when we talk about local districts making policy going forward, we have to recognize that the actions that the State Board of Education already took do impact how those local policies are going to look as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Representative, also, I, I didn't get the whole um, um, context of you saying this, but a couple minutes ago in responding to another question, you talked about uh, problematic and Marxist ideology in preventing that seeping in. Could you explain uh, what you mean uh, by that and uh, give it examples? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Wiggum, Representative Skindell. I think that what we've really tried to do in outlining divisive concepts is to hone in on some of those things that are apparent in Marxist ideology where we are putting one race or one sex above another and saying that they're inherently superior. And our goal is to say that we are all created equal, we have equality under the law, and that we need to promote that at the state level and down through all of our government entities. Did you wish to add to that? Yes, thank you. and thank you. these are good questions. This is the right topic for us to discuss. So, and uh, 
philosophically behind this, it's the concept of ideologies and advocating for specific ideologies of any type. When you think of that word, you usually think of Marxism, but there's a lot of ideologies in, our, um, in the way we live. Capitalism is an ideology. Religions are ideologies. And so advocating for one or the other, that's where it gets uh, uncomfortable, especially in those environments. And so addressing them is good. And, and that's, we were very careful not to be too provocative on any specific thing or, or comparing this to any other ideology, but just the concept of one. And I spent a lot of time, well, what is an ideology? And that, so ideology, and I took this, this is the best uh, definition, a system of, ide of ideas or ideals, especially one which forms the basis of economic or political theory or policy. And that was a good question from Representative Stewart on do you advocate for America in the Korean War context? But for what we've all talked about here, of having a venue for open exchange of ideas, that being too, um, we have to be careful not to be too, uh, to advocate strongly for opinions where there's going to be a diverse number of ideologies inside the, the classroom. That was the intent. And I'm sorry if that didn't directly answer your question, but that seemed the right place to put that comment. And follow up. Yeah, uh, Representative, you actually spurred another question uh, in, in my mind, uh, and I, I thank you for that. Um, so Representative Arthur Fowler, in uh, response to a prior question, uh, I, I think to Representative Stewart, my esteemed colleague, uh, about your keyword is promote. Um, so my understanding is your thrust of the bill is not to prohibit the teaching of something, but it's promoting a specific ideology over another uh, one. Is, could you just try to explain that a little bit more? Yes, Chairman and Representative Skindel, thank you for asking for clarification on that point. I think probably helps the most to direct you to page seven of the sub bill, and it talks about um, that nothing is to be construed as prohibiting any of the following, and I'm just going to highlight a few words, discussing or using supplemental instruction materials to teach about divisive concepts in an objective manner and without endorsement, the impartial discussion of controversial aspects of history, speech, formal debate, or substantially similar uh, subject matter. So our goal is to encourage a constructive dialogue, but to make sure that that dialogue is not being promoted, especially in the K-12 environment. However, we've also seen this in some of the local and state agencies where it's being held against an employee if they don't agree to promote a particular um, thought. And so we want to ensure that there is freedom in the workplace and freedom in the educational space to make sure that they can have a free flow of ideas and conversation around them. And Mr. Chairman, in the follow-up, because that is, that's probably the best example, like uh, for all of us as parents and as students, we want Americans to know what Marxism is. <laughs> so we need to teach it in classrooms, but not promote it or be again. It's getting that communication, having the discussion is really important. I've heard that, that phrase a lot, and I agree, and we're the right people to get it engaged in a, in a neutral format, in, a, in an objective way, in that kind of discussion. I think that's such a win for all of us if we get involved in that. So it's, it's good topicality without advocation for one. And Representative Sobecki. Oh, sorry, I didn't see him. Oh, Representative Volonsky. I didn't know. Thank you to the chair, and thank you for testifying here about your bill. Uh, I started off with some questions, but now I, I think I have an overarching question, and forgive me if I didn't see this in the bill and if it's in there. Please define promote. Mm -hmm. Chair Wiggum, Representative Golonsky, that is a great question, and I don't think that the bill specifically defines promote, so it may be something that we need to revisit with Representative Grindel. Um, I think that it may be implied through other passages in the bill that talk about only giving one side of the issue, but I'm not sure that that word specifically is defined in and of itself. Follow up. Thank you to the chair, and thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, I did hear from one of my constituents uh, specifically that one person's promotion or promoting 
is another person's teaching, which I thought was a pretty good point. And so if I were to teach Marxism and what it is on day, uh, on Monday, and then I decide I'm going to teach something else on Tuesday, if I go back to Marxism on Wednesday, do I have a problem as a promoter? Or, again, it, it goes back to us, in my opinion, micromanaging uh, what teachers are trying to do. So what I'm interested in is who is saying that anyone is promoting anything, and can you help me with understanding promotion? It might not be today. It might be through testimony. Thank you. Sorry, right, uh, thank you. These are the right questions, Chairman. These, thank you, uh, from Golonsky. Here's the definition that I have on that: is that um, it's uh, my own personal studies. So just information. My, the American Bar Association would be right, and and uh, and if we need to write down and have definition of terms in this bill, maybe that's the right thing. But. I, I um, if I may, uh, so Representative Glonsky is like, uh, she wants, to, you're wanting to know what promotion is in the bill. And so if we, def if we define it now, it, it's not going to, oh, it's I not going to do anything. No. And so, so I, I, I understand that. And so if you have a, if, if you have another question, Representative Glonsky, because obviously the bill probably needs to address that. Well, thank you for that. Go right ahead. Mr. Chair, if I could, just okay. to address the previous question. Um, I, I do think that we need to review, because I don't know the reference right off, but I'd be happy to have that conversation with you and Representative Grindel, if you don't mind. That'd be great. Thank you. So just on a different, um, different changing to a different question then. Uh, so in section, sorry, glasses. Section 1, uh, so again, I'm looking at the bill here, Section 33.13.6027A, and you d define divisive concepts, and you're saying that one example of a divisive concept is one nationality, color, ethnicity, race, or sex is inherently superior to another nationality, color, ethnicity, race, or sex. So without saying... Or, or jumping into promotion again, would you would you agree that if the, if that phrase wasn't taught, but if a child walked away with an impression or a belief that one nationality, et cetera, et cetera, was superior, would that be problematic? And if so, how would you police that? Like, who who's in trouble then? The child leaves with that opinion. Chairman Wiggum, Representative Golonsky, the goal of the bill is not to police individual thoughts or individual um, beliefs. The goal is to make sure that when we're using taxpayer dollars in the classroom or for instruction for employment, that it is not promoting a particular ideology. And so we want to make sure that no one has to ascribe to a belief that puts one person over another to be employed or to participate fully in their educational uh, opportunities. Follow up, Representative? Okay. Um, Representative Sobecki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just curious, though. Maybe I'm too loud. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, because you do have um, tagged on here, though, that dollars would then, you know, could be um, clawed back or not given out, um, be in education or to agencies and what have you, um, because of an incident. And I was trying to go back, because I'm kind of going between the sub bill and the original bill, but I'm just kind of curious, though, is so can you give us an example? So I'm thinking in my head a a, a teacher, in this illustration, a teacher is talking about a subject. Um, a principal hears about it, or, or the child goes home and has a conversation with their parents about how they did not, you know, agree with what was taking place in the classroom. Then, um, within that funding, be pulled from the whole school district. 
um, or what, is there a process that would go through? Would there be hearings? Would there be um, um, uh, evidence that would need to be brought into play? Uh, just kind of curious of how, why would we be um, taking funding away from a school district and or an agency because of an individual incident that could be handled possibly through policy that one has and or their HR department, you know, kind of like private business does. Thank you so much for that question, Representative Sobecki, and through the chairman. This was an area that we had a lot of discussion around because um, there was a concern that we needed to put some emphasis behind the ability to teach a promote a particular concept over another concept and yet we wanted to make sure that there was due process in place to make sure that no teacher and no school district was unfairly punished so um, there's protections in place through the chapter 119 hearing process there is also protections in place through um, confirmed reports. They can't just have a child go home and say, I didn't like what they taught me at school today. And the parents say, okay, now I'm going to uh, make a, a problem for the district. They actually have to confirm that the teacher was knowingly and recklessly promoting the particular ideology in the classroom. And after there's a confirmed report, then they can move forward with other steps. But it is not something that they can just willy-nilly grab a hold of and say, I don't like this teacher. I want to find a reason to get rid of them follow up or, or punish the district we, we really tried to make sure that the language would prohibit that follow up no I'm not I'm just <laughs> yes follow up. and that's where I, I'm a little concerned um, with this section of there um, because I, I've been in situations before as a school board member as I'm sure that you have as a state school board member um, that there'll be accusations um, that will come forth that um, cannot be substantiated and but there's these threats so that that's making me uncomfortable because I'm really afraid that educators um, not only have we continued to attack what they're doing and, and not fund them appropriately but this is another um, stab at them that is really getting into the teaching profession and us um, really micromanaging and letting the instead of letting the profession be the profession. Um, so I'm kind of I'm kind of curious. What would you have to say around that? Chair Wiggum and Representative Sebecki, yeah, we we really appreciate your attention to detail in this area because our intent was to make sure that we put the guardrails in place to make sure that the classroom was not promoting a particular ideology. But at the same time, we wanted to be cognizant that teachers shouldn't be punished for trying to represent a well-rounded content to their students. And if they're promoting a healthy debate or if they are teaching uh, objectively, we want to make sure that they are protected. So if you are looking at the language and you see something that you think that we could improve, please do uh, bring that to myself and Rep. Grindel, and I think we'd be happy to converse with you more about if we need to address a particular concern. Follow up. And this is you know, another, because I think there's going to be some caution. There'll be a lot of caution if this was to be enacted. Um, and so I'm going to flip it, though, is that a student, and we'll, we'll say George Floyd, that was a lot of, that was going on, it's still continuing to go on. Teachers may not want to have a conversation about it in the classroom because they're afraid that they might get funding taken away uh, from their school district. But if a student could bring that up, and then it could be construed, uh, for, you know, the teacher may be uncomfortable about having that conversation because of all the um, restrictions now are on their profession um, that could draw the funding away so they'll even have less funding. We can't even get them funded correctly. That's why I think we need to do the fair funding model, but that's for another time, another bill. But, um, you know, what would you say to those that when the students might bring the subject matter up and want to have that conversation within the classroom? Chair Wiggum, Representative Sebecki, we actually already have federal laws that guide what students are and are not able to say in the classroom. And as we know, they have very wide free speech provisions. The difference is that they aren't using taxpayer dollars to promote their particular ideology, nor are they in a position of authority. And when you have someone that is in a position of authority, the burden of proof changes. And so we want to make sure that 
those who are given the responsibility of guiding and directing the content of the class as a whole are not promoting a particular ideology, we do not want to stifle a student sharing their belief and the teacher redirecting or offering commentary. I think that on, on page seven where it talks about the exemptions that we do go through really specifically how a teacher could handle that. And, and I actually had a call with a teacher this past week who said they're already concerned because of the steps that the state has already taken and because of the emphasis in certain teacher development programs that they've participated in, that they might unwittingly step into a problem and not know it until after the fact. So the goal of the legislation is to make sure that teachers are really clear on what they can and can't do and hopefully that will help prevent them from stepping unknowingly into a situation that might be negative. Representative Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so my next questions are actually a little bit outside of um, the the classroom aspect of this because um, to my understanding, you know, this bill and I think as you had mentioned earlier is actually a lot more far reaching uh, than just K through 12 or just higher ed and actually goes so far, I believe is to include um, contractors. So state agencies, government contractors. And so I guess my question is just, you know, I, I have issues, you know, with the bill, um, both narrowly in terms of inside of the classroom, but certainly outside of the classroom as well. And so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about why, why you decided to make it so far reaching. Chair Wiggum and Representative Kelly, thank you for pointing out that the bill does go further than just K-12 or higher education. We really felt that it was important, uh, excuse me. <laughs> We really felt that it was important to include government employees as well because we were hearing reports from both the state and local level that certain trainings were beginning to promote a particular ideology and there was a fear from the part of some of these employees that if they didn't hold to the belief that was promoted in the training that they would lose their job or that they would have some sort of um, repercussion on their employment. and so. We tried to address all of these concepts because we believe that Ohio should be promoting a non-discriminatory practice in employment and in education. And the point to the contractors, I can double check, but I believe the reference to contractors was if they are providing the training that it would apply to them. And I, I think that that's the section where a lot of state agencies have been using a particular contractor and so we just want them to um, be aware that promoting a particular ideological concept is not the practice in Ohio. We want to make sure that it is non-discriminatory. Oh. Let me see if I can get this work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that. So I guess, I mean, in my uh, professional experience, you know, before I came to the legislature, you know, I think getting trained um, in concepts that, you know, might be a little comfortable, might be a little uncomfortable, um, you know, going through um, experiences, learning how to adapt um, has been has been a, a positive thing um, for me. And so I think especially when we're thinking about um, like diversity, equity, inclusion, um, that those types of trainings can actually, you know, be helpful in a myriad of different places, whether it's in continuing education, whether it's in the professional realm, you know, certainly in this job, we uh, deal with folks from all over the state, all different kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of different life experiences. And so I'm, I'm just wondering how substantially the bill could change the ability um, for those things to be offered, you know, because I view that as sort of like an, in, an inherently positive offering from a, whether it's a government agency, a private business, whatever. And so I'm just wondering how you think this bill could impact that. Okay. Chair Wiggum, Representative Kelly, thank you for that. I, I think that there's a couple things. One, um, the bill specifically defines a divisive concept as something that is pitting one person against another specifically based upon their characteristics. And a lot of the training that you mentioned 
is geared toward helping people understand one another's differences and to find the strengths and to work together through them. So as far as it applied to that, I don't think that it would discourage it. I think that where there could be a potential conflict is if a training is saying that one race is superior to another race or that one person or sex is superior to another person or sex. If that were the case, there would be some conflicts because it would be defined as a divisive concept. Um, do you have something to add? And, and further, so that could even be said, but if you're mandating compliance or adherence under, under threat of punishment, that would be totally wrong. This bill outlaws that. The, and um, if you're going to be harmed socially, professionally, or economically for not complying or agreeing with the proposed legislation that's, or the ideology, that would be a violation of this bill. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I did just have um, one last follow-up question. Thank you um, for answering all these. Um, it is very, very much uh, um, appreciated. Um, and this question actually goes back um, to what Rep. Sebecki was asking about in terms of um, the resources being clawed back. And I apologize for not um, having the opportunity to delve into this um, a little more deeply. I was just wondering, uh, in terms of, you know, offense one, it's 25% reduction of funding, and then it goes up from there. Is that on an ongoing basis, or is it like over the period of a year? Is it over a period of five years? Is it on a rolling basis? So maybe you have um, an infraction at one point in time. Does that follow you forever? Does the clock reset? How does that work? Chair Wiggum and Representative Sebecki, I'm looking for the exact page here because I want to uh, be specific. However, there it is. So on page five under section C, I, I would reference back to the words knowingly and recklessly violate. So you're not going to get there just because someone uh, accuses you of it. You have to have a confirmed report. You have to have knowingly and recklessly violated the provisions of the bill. And then the Department of Education and the State Board of Education are given the responsibility for drafting the rules that would govern the process. So they would have an open public hearing process on what would constitute the offense, what would uh, the criteria be for getting into the, the punishment, and what would be the criteria for getting out of the punishment. And uh, I think that 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 covers all of that part, but the state superintendent is the active party for confirming whether or not the district was in violation. So there's some checks and balances that we tried to put in. And again, if you see something that you think could be strengthened, I think this is a, an area we had a lot of discussion about and would be happy to have your, your direct thoughts and feedback on the language. Representative John. Thank you, Chair Wiggum. Thank you for both being here. So there was some discussion earlier about defining divisive, fi defining promote, which I think is important. We need to be very specific in the bills that we pass and the legislation that we write. But sometimes uh, there was a, there's a uh, <laughs> there's a quote that I refer to a lot. If it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. I'm not promoting using that language in the bill. <laughs> However, sometimes it just is what it is and we know what it is. And so I'm going to give an example. There's also been a question about, you know, what are some examples and how, does, this, do, does this really happen? And so I'm going to give an example and see if this is the kind of thing that you're talking about. So I have children that's been in public education, gone through college. Um, such divisive concepts were, were in one of my son's classes to the, to the point, every class, every class, divisive concepts, 10 minutes beginning of, of every class, to the point that he had to begin asking his college professors um, when he was writing opinion papers, now, do you want me to write it according to your opinion so that I can get an A, or can I express my own freedom of thought in this paper, even if it differs from yours, and still get an A because it's a quality paper. 
And that's an example. Is that the kind of example that you're talking about that absolutely happens not only to my son, to my children that were in college, but to their friends that were in college? Is that the kind of example you're asking, you're talking about? Chairman of the Vice Chair, that's exactly right. And what I just wrote about being coerced into submitting to a position advocated by somebody in power under threat of penalty. That's exactly what we're talking about. And you think of all the different situations that that could occur. Chairman, if I can oh, add to that. Please. Um, we did address higher education specifically because while we want academic freedom in every educational space, we are hearing a lot of reports about students being graded on their personal beliefs and opinions rather than on the quality of their work. And so if as you go through the substitute bill, you'll see that that was something that we really tried to emphasize is that the grade should be reflective of the quality of their work and the way that they address the assignment, not on their personal belief. And I, I, would, I don't know if they would actually qualify under some of these divisive concepts, but I've seen the same in some of my siblings who went through various college programs. My sis, youngest sister graduated this year. One of my brothers graduated, I believe, five years ago. Time flies. And they would come home with their assignment and if they had a teacher that they didn't have a complete agreement on a particular topic, in, it became a problem because they were getting docked in their grade for writing their perspective as opposed to the teacher's preferred perspective. And so our goal is to stress that you don't give up your ideological belief in the classroom, but that promoting it or giving a grade based upon someone's ideological belief undermines the entire conversation at an educational level. And we want to promote free speech and free thought. We have follow up. Oh, okay. Um, Representative Skindell. Thank you. Uh, just a, a thought in follow up uh, to um, your, your most recent response. How outside of the um, instructor, teacher, professor, um, overtly stating that you're great is based upon my disagreement with your ideological belief. Um, how do you determine that they've gotten lower grade based upon ideological belief? Mr. Chairman, Representative Skindell, I think that we may have some proponents that will come in and maybe speak to this a little bit more, but in my personal experience with my siblings, what happened was how the question was phrased. So it wasn't, we would like you to write a paper um, exploring the differences between this, or it was, we want you to write a paper and it has to be exactly on this topic and promoting this perspective. And so if the paper didn't comply with that, or if it promoted a different perspective on the same issue, that is where the grade came in. So that was my personal experience with, with the work that my siblings were tasked with. I'm sure that there's a variety of, of examples in the state. Follow up? Uh, yes. Um, just uh, at a point of reference, I'm um, kind of referring to page three. of the sub bill uh, around line 68, which is the definition of race uh, or sex scapegoating. Um, and this is the portion of the definition that uh, deals with assigning fault. So, if um, I'm teaching uh, American history and teaching that uh, white Americans uh, used lynching to terrorize and control black people in the 19th century or early 20th century because I'm assigning fault by saying white people were using lynching to terrorize um, and control black people, that's exactly what happened. Uh, I would be in violation of your bill. Um, 
don't or, or not. Or I haven't looked through all the exceptions. So I was just, so if you could just respond to that, Thank if I you. would be. Thank you, Representative Skindell and Chair Wiggum. Um, I, I think that we have an exception for that um, on page seven. And again, just to highlight some of those, it says nothing in this section shall be construed to prohibit any of the following discussing or using supplemental instructional materials as part of a larger course of instruction of academic instruction to teach about divisive concepts in an objective manner and without endorsement. And these materials can include the following. Uh, the history of an ethnic group as described in textbooks and instructional materials, the impartial discussion of controversial aspects of history that may fall under that category, the impartial instruction on the historical oppression of a particular group of people based on nationality, race, color, ethnicity, religion, sex, class, or geographic region. And it, it continues on, but it would be my thought that it would probably fall under one of those categories. Follow up. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and one of the thoughts I had in going through this is, you know, I'm an attorney uh, looking through this, and it raises a lot of questions and ambiguity. And my concern is um, the teacher or professor does not have a lawyer standing alongside them, instructing them and advising them that this is pursuant to law and not. Um, you know, how, how do you expect... Um, 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 teachers being able to teach um, without having to worry, and and would this bill actually um, 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 I'm trying to think of the word uh, um, give hesitancy to the teacher in in uh, uh, trying to uh, 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 teach certain subjects. Chair Wiggum, Representative Skindell, I think that is the exact reason that we need this bill, because we already have teachers that are hesitant to address certain topics out of concern that they are going to end up offending someone and that it's not going to be um, reflected well in their uh, teacher evaluation or in how they're represented to their school board. And so this bill seeks to clarify that they are supposed to teach a variety of, of concepts, our history, that they just personally are not allowed to promote a particular ideology. And that aligns with things that are already required under federal law. What I think that it would help with the most is professional development classes for the teacher. Because right now, there's some ambiguity around what that professional development should look like in these areas. And when we outline specifically what might constitute a divisive concept in the bill, it would allow that professional development to reflect a more positive atmosphere to the teacher and say, hey, you need to teach complete history or you need to talk about this divisive area in a way that pr promotes both sides objectively, but you need to be careful around putting your own belief into the curriculum. And so that's really the goal with clarifying is to give teachers the confidence that they don't have right now. I, okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Okay. Seeing none, thank, thank you, you for your testimony today. Okay. Okay. That's it. Okay, uh, seeing no further business before this committee, this committee stands adjourned.